Welcome to Meet the Experts, where we explore international trade and market issues with leading fisheries professionals. I'm your host, Joe Zelazny. Today, we're joined by Nicole Franz, the Sustainable Livelihoods Team Lead in the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. Nicole, it's great to have you with us. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Excellent. Well, let's jump right in. So today we're here to talk about small scale fisheries. And so Nicole, can you tell us why are small scale fisheries so important and what are they exactly? Well, what are they exactly is a million dollar question because there is no universal definition of small scale fisheries and, and there cannot be given the high degree of diversity of the sector. Um, just picture, for example, a Norwegian coastal fisher in a motorized vessel. But then think of a woman gleaning mollusks in Kenya or selling smoked fish in a local market. Both represent small scale fisheries, arguably, but both in a very different way. Said that, however, there are sufficient shared characteristics to justify discussing small scale fisheries at the global level. And small scale fisheries, in fact, is increasingly being recognized, especially in developing countries, for their contribution to sustainable uh, food systems and to sustainable development more broadly. Uh, including in, in their contribution to livelihoods. For example, it is estimated that over 90% of all of those that are operating in capture fisheries are, um, are in, in small scale fisheries. And the vast majority of these people are living in developing countries. It is estimated that about half of these people are women. And the women are primarily engaged in post harvest activities, especially in marketing and processing, but they're also active in, in harvesting activities, often that is overlooked. Um, said that, there's an increasing interest in, in finding ways to objectively characterize the fisheries as, as large or small scale fisheries. Um, this is for a variety of reasons, which can span the dimensions of governance, of, of economics. For example, in relation to, to taxation, to subsidies, to, to special preferences in relation to trade regimes, um, but also in relation to fisheries management and related regulations. So the issue of, of defining or char characterizing small scale fisheries is, is also made more difficult by the use of, of many terms. So we talk about small scale fisheries here, but the sector is often referred to also as artisanal fisheries, as subsistence fisheries, aboriginal fisheries, indigenous fisheries, coastal fisheries, nearshore fisheries. So there are many ways to, to term this sector, which makes it more, more, more difficult. And on the other hand, you have what is termed large scale fishery sector. And the large scale fishery sector is sometimes also called commercial, semi-industrial or industrial. So there's a lot of terminology that does not have agreed definitions. Um, so in some countries, you may even have that fisheries are, are defined in more than these two categories. And there are also some of the intermediate categories. So you can see that it's very complex to come up with a, with a concrete definition of what small scale fisheries are. Um, in some cases, there, there have been uh, definitions have been used that, that identify fisheries based on the number of characteristics, but, but those can be limiting because sometimes they only refer to the vessel size, to the, to the engine power, uh, to the gear type, to the type of operations. But again, it's not that clear cut, it's not that, that black and white. So the narrow characterization can tend to exclude some fishes. It should be rightfully considered small scale, for example. Um, for example, food fishes can often fall off these um, these characterizations, those that are not using any 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 vessel or that are not using any any type of uh, of uh, support to to fish, so they are they are losing out and they will not be categorized and they will fall through through the cracks when there are, for example, um, data collection efforts to understand how many people depend on on small scale fisheries. So despite all of these challenges. Um, characterizing the scale of fishing units is often helpful and also necessary to support evidence-based uh, decision-making policies and fisheries management. 
related research and governance at, at the national level, at the local level, but also at the regional level. And it is also important to understand the, the global role of, of small scale fisheries. So what is really needed is better methods to assess the scale without falling into the trap of these narrow definitions. And there are some attempts now happening to find ways to characterize the sector more, taking into account not only the aspects, like we said before, in relation to the size of the vessel, the length of the vessel, the engine, but also how, for example, um, a harvest operation is connected to the market. Is it servicing an export market or is it for domestic consumption? How many people are on the boat? What is the ownership structure of the, of the, um, of the fishing, fishing unit? So all of this is something to, to help identify the characteristics of the fisheries. And it's almost moving away from this dichotomy between small scale and large scale and looking at fisheries as a continuum to understand at the national level, for example, how, how the national fishery sector uh, looks and how it needs to be supported based on those characteristics and specificities. Thanks, Nicole. That's all really interesting. Um, and I think important to reiterate, 90% of people involved in capture fisheries globally um, involved in what can be considered small scale fisheries, in spite of, of everything you said about not having a, a narrow definition. Um, but again, very interesting, some of the work ongoing to, to categorize and, and better um, define for, for policy purposes, um, the scale, quote unquote, of, of a given fishery unit. Um, so next question I wanted to ask you is that, you know, I think something a lot of people think about when they hear small scale fisheries is, is fishing for subsistence. And, and you even mentioned that as, as sort of an alternative term for small scale fisheries. Um, but I was wondering, does small scale fisheries production also enter into trade and commerce? Well, um, Currently, international trade statistics do not indicate whether uh, a fish, a fish product is coming from large scale fishery, from small scale fishery or from aquaculture. So there's no way to distinguish that origin through the international trade data that is available. But we do know, of course, from, from evidence from other sources that small scale fisheries actors engage in trade at all levels, at the global level, at the regional level and at the, at the domestic level. The degree of that engagement varies by country, by region, by, by product also. So to, just to give you a concrete example, um, for the participation of small scale fisheries in high value global value chains, uh, we can think of the Nile perch from Lake Victoria. So this is fished by very small uh, vessels, by very small boats. Uh, so it is de facto small scale fishing operation at the lake level, but then it enters the value chain and the processing and ultimately it is targeting high value markets, uh, primarily in Europe. So there is a, a very tight connection between the small scale fishery in Lake Victoria and, and the export markets. Uh, similarly, lobster from Mexico, for example, it's also fished in a, in a very traditional way. It's, it's coming from small scale fisheries, but it's a high value product that is entering uh, primarily the, the American, the US American market, for example. Um, in terms of, of low value products, we can also see that they're entering uh, important regional markets, for example. Dried fish, again, from the great African lakes, for example, are, are staple food throughout uh, African regions. And they provide highly nutritious food for a for large, large part of the population, in particular, the most vulnerable. So that's a highly traded fish it's in that case it's high quantities high volumes of low value fish but it makes a huge difference in terms of providing the nutritional uh, benefits to to those poorer parts of the population so what is generally recognized in relation to market access and, and trade for small-scale fisheries actors is that they however face many challenges in securing fair market access and the fair distribution of the resulting benefits from that trade. So the global community has, has recognized that and has committed to addressing this by formulating and agreeing on one of the uh, sustainable development goal targets, and that is target SDG 14B, which calls specifically 
to provide access for small-scale artisanal fisheries, uh, fishes to marine resources, but also to markets. Wow, okay. So given the diversity of small-scale fisheries um, and, and the fact that, that their products um, are often traded and enter into commerce, but may vary um, in, in terms of which markets they're headed to based on based on the value and the, the geographic location of, of where that fisheries product is produced. Um, I'm curious to know if there's an international consensus on how to approach improving small scale fisheries to overcome some of those challenges you mentioned, um, including securing market access and fair distribution of benefits. Um, you know, given that there's this, this overarching global goal, SDG 14 point B, is there some guidance that sort of you know, helps uh, inform the global community on, on how collectively we can move toward overcoming those challenges? Uh, yes, yes, there is that, that guidance. Uh, in 2014, the FAO Committee on Fisheries, um, in which all the FAO member states uh, come together, together with other partners and act as observers from regional organizations, from civil society, from NGOs, from research, um, they all came together in the session of the Committee on Fisheries and they endorsed an international instrument that is entirely dedicated to small-scale fisheries. This instrument are the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication. They are the result of a, of a really participatory development process in which the, the key issues for small-scale fisheries were identified by all the main stakeholders uh, from government, but primarily from small scale fisher, fishers and their organizations and small scale fisheries uh, processes and, and, and traders themselves. And not only the issues, but also how to address them. So these guidelines, in short, the small scale fisheries guidelines are really unique in, in that respect as they represent this dedicated first international instrument to provide the guidance for small-scale fisheries governance and development. And importantly, these guidelines have a dedicated chapter on value chains, post harvest and trade, in which the rights of fishers and fish workers are recognized to, to act individually and collectively to improve their livelihoods through trade at the global, regional, national level and by en enhancing value chains and post harvest operations. Okay, excellent to hear that there's already been considerable thought gone into exactly how we can improve small scale fisheries. Um, next, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the extent to which small scale fisheries uh, form part of, of trade flows at both the global, regional um, and national level. And, and also would be really interested to hear your views on, on what FAO and in particular Globefish can do to support a more integrated trade scenario for small-scale fisheries production? Yeah, well, markets, be they national, regional, or global, present particular opportunities and challenges for small-scale fisheries. Um, in terms of opportunities, there is a potential to earn a higher value per unit. And it is necessary to engage with actors who can facilitate access, for example, to financial resources, to provide capacity building and training uh, to, to develop the skills of the small scale fisheries actors. Um, and that really is, is an investment in the development of these small scale fisheries value chains. And, and that is where FAO can play a role in supporting, in supporting that development. Another important area where FAO and Globefish can support the participation of small scale fisheries in international trade or regional trade at all levels is in relation to the very complex framework of rules and regulations that are governing fisheries value chains. There's a, a wide variety of trade policies that are implemented at the country level um, through tariffs, subsidies, non-tariff measures, and all of these can really significantly influence fisheries production and trade and they can really have an impact on who can access markets. So it can be very challenging to, to meet these regulations and these standards, especially for small scale fisheries actors. So developing the related awareness about those rules and regulations, and then the related capacity to comply with them 
in particular in developing countries is again an important area for FAO and Globefish to act. Another aspect is also in relation to the unequal power relations that often exist between different actors along the value chain, where some are more vulnerable and more disadvantaged in terms of contracts, but also, for example, in terms of, of, of conditions and even labor conditions that, that are affecting the, the market and the value chain. So again, training, awareness raising, capacity development, uh, in particular of small-scale fisheries organizations who can act as, as a multiplier, really as a catalyst of that knowledge, of those additional skills, can, can greatly enhance um, that small-scale fishers can benefit from, from the markets, that they can increase their, their literacy, their, their capacity to engage and, and, and participate and, and really also become more equal partners in, in the market. Hey, well, it's clear that there are a number of things that um, that that have been identified as concrete interventions to to really improve the the capacity and ability of of small scale fishers and small scale fishers organizations to support um, engagement in value chains and to be able to be more more effective players and 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 and, and through that um, improve the the development and and livelihoods of those of those individuals. Um, that's excellent. Now, I want to switch gears here a little bit and, and talk about, in particular, post-harvest losses. Um, post-harvest losses are a significant challenge in, in all fisheries and, in particular, in small-scale fisheries. Not only do these losses result in lost income to fishers, processors, and traders, uh, but they also contribute to food insecurity and mal malnutrition by reducing the number of fish available for human consumption. What are some of the ways in which post-harvest losses can be reduced in small-scale fisheries in particular? Yeah, post-harvest losses are, are certainly a, a major concern and post-harvest losses in general and food systems were also a topic of the recent uh, UN Food System Pre-Summit. So this is certainly an area where we can collectively improve a lot. Um, it's very difficult to have accurate assessments of post-harvest losses in small-scale fisheries, also due to the often informal nature of, of the sector. So not all of the catches recorded, uh, often many of the market transactions are informal. So we don't really have uh, the numbers, but from the evidence that we have, it is estimated that the, the post-harvest fish losses in small-scale fisheries are somewhere between 10 and 40 percent of the life weight equivalent of, of the fish that is caught. So this is an enormous loss. Um, a source of loss, major source of loss in small scale fisheries is due to uh, poor handling. So the lack of ice, uh, the lack of appropriate processing facilities, the lack of access to, to, to running water, all of those issues hamper the capacity to reduce these post-harvest losses. So working on increasing sustainable practices along the value chain that can help avoid those losses and the waste by combining, for example, traditional uh, practices with cost-efficient methods and new technology and innovations can really change that situation. Something that can also help to, to reduce the post-harvest losses is to, is to invest in, in value addition try to extend the shelf life of products, try to use the different parts of the products uh, in different ways. So by, by using more of the fish, by, by reducing the, the losses, we then also have a, a beneficial effect on, on the fisheries management because we need to fish less because less is lost. So the pressure on, on the system uh, is lower. So really working on reducing post-harvest losses has, has a very close connection to ensuring the sustainable fisheries management. Um, value addition techniques can also lead to, to increased income and the, really the diversification of the range of products that are available, which may also be an opportunity to tap into, into new markets. Um, to achieve this, for example, these improvements in value addition, 
Something that is also needed is proper access to financial services for small scale fishers and, and fish workers, obviously. Um, so that includes access to credit, access to, to micro, microfinance, to, to saving services. Um, it also includes, for example, access to insurances. So providing more appropriate uh, services for this target audience, uh, coupled with also access to more appropriate infrastructure, uh, related training on, on how to use that infrastructure, how to maintain that infrastructure is really important. And something else that, that needs to be improved is also the, the entrepreneurial skills of small scale fisheries actors. Because again, by, by, by opening the scope, by, by, by increasing the, the exposure to what kind of product can be marketed to whom and, and how, is something that can have uh, an impact on the quality overall of of which products are flowing along the value chain. Thank you, Nicole. That's um, that's all great. Now, can you share with us any um, success stories where post harvest losses have been reduced or value addition increased as a result of changes in behavior or application um, of some of the the techniques? Um, and interventions that you've that you've just mentioned in small scale fisheries. Yeah, we have some some concrete examples um, that FAO has developed in, in collaboration with with its partners on on the ground at the country level, um, and they they on one hand they contribute to reducing post harvest losses, but also to creating more awareness about the food quality and the food safety. Um, one concrete example is, for example, the use of, of raised drying racks that have been introduced in, in Burundi um, and in, other, in many other countries. And just by, by, by putting, for example, uh, small fish, small pelagics on a drying rack, on a raised rack, instead of drying them on the floor, on the ground, you can really massively increase uh, the the rate of, of return of what you're putting on your rack. Um, because when you have them on the, on the ground, what we have seen is that in many cases, you would lose about half of, of your product due to the rainy season, for example, or due to contamination uh, from, from, from other agents that are, that are uh, on the ground. So just by, by putting these, these simple structures that, that don't expose a fish and then also let the air run through it more easily, we can massively increase um, increase the product quality. Uh, another example is the use of the FAO Tiaroya processing technique uh, or the so-called FTT ovens, um, which is an improved way to, uh, to smoke fish, which is now widely used in Africa. And I think it now it is in, distributed in about 17 countries and there are now also pilot projects to adopt this technology also in four countries in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and this technique is basically improving the quality of the final product, but it is also much more appropriate in terms of how this oven is used for the health of the women that are usually working um, they're less exposed to smoke and uh, they don't have to bend down so much. And, and the use of, of um, the firewood that is used for operating these ovens is also much more efficient compared to more traditional uh, smoking techniques in, in, the, in the fish smoking. Well, great to hear about some of these real world examples um, of how you know, basic cost-effective uh, solutions can really help reduce not only reduce post-harvest losses, but also um, improve the working conditions for, for small-scale fisheries actors. Now, we're almost out of time, but before we go, I wanted to talk about the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, which was declared by the UN General Assembly for 2022. And that's next year, that's coming right up. Now, FAO has been designated the lead agency. What is FAO doing to prepare for IAFA, and how can our listeners get involved? Yeah, we're very excited uh, that we have the next year dedicated to small scale fisheries and aquaculture. So we're in the middle of preparing for the year that will be launched on the 18th of November. And we have established already uh, a dedicated website that is available in, in six languages, 
where you can find information about the year and where you can also find uh, what is called the global action plan for the international year. Uh, this global action plan was developed by the International Steering Committee of the International Year, in which we have representatives from seven uh, from the seven FEO regions, and we also have uh, an important number of other partners, uh, non-state actors that are representing either small-scale fisheries, small-scale aquaculture, or both sectors, and also other partner UN agencies that are supporting the preparations of the year. So in this global action plan, we have identified uh, seven pillars that that have been have been found to be particularly important to be taking action on. And, and one of those pillars is in relation to economic sustainability. And this is obviously an area where markets, access to, to trade, market fair distribution of benefits, um, improved post-harvest practices, the reduction of post-harvest losses we spoke about before, are coming in very strongly. And what we are working on now is, um, for example, the identification of, of good practices around the world that can be showcased and that can be shared throughout celebrations at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level next year on how we can improve uh, the value chain, the small scale fisheries and aquaculture value chains around the world. So it, it's really an opportunity to collectively share what we have learned and to inspire and, and to move forward in a, in a more sustainable manner. And we really call on everybody who is interested to contact us. There is um, a contact address, email address in our website. It's uh, ayafa uh, at fao.org. So everybody can contact us there and share ideas and share thoughts. Uh, we also have an event section on our website where we invite partners to, to include what they are planning to celebrate the international year. And that will be a way also to, to reach a broader audience and to share and inspire again what can be done. It's, it's a year that's for everybody. It's, it's led by the FAO, but it is an opportunity for all of us to be creative and to, to do whatever we can to draw attention to the sector and to make it better in the future. Excellent. Well, we all look forward to to IAFA 2022 and to partaking in the in the various activities um, in support of improving small scale fisheries. Nicole, it was great speaking with you today. Uh, thanks again for joining us and sharing your insights. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much for having me. And to our listeners. Thank you for joining Meet the Experts, where we explore international trade and market issues with leading fisheries professionals. We look forward to having you with us next time when we'll continue the conversation. In the meantime, subscribe to the Globefish newsletter and get the latest information from our website at globefish.org. Goodbye for now.